I'm Dr. Mark Atala, and I want to welcome you to the 14th chapter of Schultz & Schultz's History of Modern Psychology. Today we'll be talking about psychoanalysis after the founding. So it's basically about the Neo-Freudians and the humanistic psychology movement. Now the chapter begins with a vignette about Abraham Maslow, who was one of seven children born to Russian immigrants and who grew up isolated, unloved, friendless, and unwanted. Apparently he was also considered ugly. Now, one of the commonalities that we'll see in this chapter is that most of the therapists had just awful childhoods. Barely 20 years after Freud founded psychoanalysis, it splintered into competing factions. And these were people, people who disagreed with Freud and each other. As we saw in the previous chapter, Freud did not react well to these dissenters. A major change introduced was the expansion of the, of the concept of the ego and it was now seen as having a more primary and extensive role, and included ideas about how the ego was more independent of the id, possessed its own energy, and had functions separate from the id. Neo-Freudians also minimized the importance of infantile sexuality and the Oedipus complex, and suggested that personality development uh, was determined primarily by psychosocial rather than psychosexual forces. Well, let's start talking about Anna Freud. And she's the youngest of Freud's six children. And she fa felt that she was the least favored girl in the family, but she was the only one of Freud's children to become an analyst. She described her childhood as being unhappy and that she was bored and lonely. At 14, she started sitting in on meetings of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society. And she said that she would just sit quietly in a corner absorbing everything that was said. At 22, she entered into analysis with her father. She told him about her violent dreams, which involved shooting, killing, dying, and defending him from his enemies. They held their therapy sessions six nights a week for four years, and I believe it's indicative of the incestuous nature of the psychoanalytic movement that Freud would analyze his own daughter. In 1924, she presents a paper to the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society called Beating Fantasies and Daydreams. Now, it was supposedly based on a patient's case history, but it was actually about her own fantasies, which involved beating, masturbation, and an incestuous father-daughter love relationship. It did get her uh, membership in the society, though. She also publishes two books, An Introduction to the Technique of Child Analysis in 1927, which was about her approach to psychoanalytic therapy with children. It took into account their relative immaturity and their level of verbal skills. Her innovations also included the use of play materials and observations of the child in a home setting. In 1936, she publishes The Ego and the Mechanisms of Defense and the standard list of Freudian defense mechanisms was substantially her work. And the book was about how they protect the ego from anxiety. Now, Freud once considered Jung to be the, his heir to the psychoanalytic movement. He called him, quote, my successor and crown prince. After they split in 1914, Jung developed his analytical psychology, which opposed most of Freud's work. Jung's childhood was lonely, isolated, and unhappy. His mother suffered from emotional disorders, and his father was moody. Years later, a neighbor said about Jung as a child, quote, I never had come across such an asocial monster before. At critical times, Jung resolved his problems through dreams. So, for example, his college major was revealed to him in a dream. He gets his medical degree from the University of Basel in 1900, and in 1905, he's at the University of Zurich lecturing in psychiatry. In 1903, Jung married the second wealthiest heiress in Switzerland, and her name was Emma Rosenbach, and she was also an analyst and author, or excuse me, Rauschenbach. She actually maintained a regular correspondence with Freud that began in 1906. Because he was now wealthy, Jung resigned from the University of Zurich and devoted himself to writing, research, and his private practice. Jung and his wife maintained a formal, rigid approach to raising children. 
Now your textbook says that they had three daughters, but they actually had four daughters and a son. I've actually seen pictures of them. And that's Jung with his wife uh, to the right there. They had limited, limited physical contact with their children and no kissing or hugging. When they said hello or goodbye, they shook hands if they touched at all, which sounds reminiscent of John Watson's own treatment of his children. Jung read The Interpretation of Dreams and considered it to be a masterpiece. In 1906, he started his correspondence with Freud, and in 1907, tra uh, traveled to Vienna to visit him. Their first meeting lasted for 13 hours. Now, Jung had an established professional reputation before he ever met Freud. Therefore, he may have been less impressionable and suggestible than the younger analysts who were basically in awe of Freud. In 1911, Jung is made the president of the International Psychoanalytic Association. And this was at Freud's insistence and over the opposition of the Viennese members. Freud believed that due to anti-Semitism, the president should not be Jewish. Now, the Viennese analysts, most of whom were Jewish, resented and distrusted Jung, who was clearly Freud's favorite. In 1912, Jung publishes The Psychology of the Unconscious, and he was worried about this book because his own position differed significantly from Freud's, and he knew that that would damage their relationship. Now, after the publication of the book, their friendship was strained, and they ended their personal correspondence in 1912. In 1914, Jung resigned and withdrew from the association, and so that was their formal split. The same year, uh, Jung, actually the next year, Jung was stricken with intense emotional problems. This was his breakdown. He considered suicide and kept a gun next to his bed. His breakdown lasted for three years, and he was haunted by visions of a bloody apocalypse. Dreams were very important to him, as we said earlier, and he recorded his dreams in calligraphy and elaborate drawings like the snake and the cross, which is to the right. This journal was kept in secret and wasn't published until 2009. And it was published as, uh, called, it's called the Red Book. He resolved his problems by confronting his unconscious mind. So he decided to follow his unconscious impulses as revealed in dreams and fantasies and developed his own theory of personality. Jung concluded that the most important stage in personality development wasn't childhood, but middle age. And Jung's behavior, he, he did recover, but his behavior remained unusual. And he would greet the coffee pot and frying pans in the morning and hide money in books and jars that he buried and then forgot about. But throughout all this, throughout this period, he continued to see patients. What about his theory, analytical psychology? Well, Jung's theory had no Oedipus complex. He believed that sex played a minimal role in human motivation. And that's ironic because Freud had anxiety about sex and thought it was all important, whereas Jung made no attempt to limit his sexual activities, but thought that sex was not very important. They also differed over the libido, which Freud saw in sexual terms and Jung saw as life energy of which sex was only a part. Jung believed that people were shaped by the past, but also by their goals for the future. So for Jung, personality, as we said earlier, uh, wasn't set in the first five years of your life, but could change throughout a person's lifetime. Jung also probed more deeply into the unconscious mind and came up with both the personal and the collective unconscious. Jung says that the personal unconscious contains memories, impulses, wishes, faint perceptions, and other experiences that have been suppressed or forgotten. The collective unconscious is unknown to the individual and contains the inherited experiences of all previous generations, including our animal ancestors. And these universal evolutionary experiences form the basis of personality. Archetypes are inherited tendencies within the collective unconscious, and we typically experience archetypes in the form of emotions associated with significant life events, such as birth, adolescence, marriage, and death. These archetypes dispose people to act similarly to ancestors who had been in the same situations. Jung referred to the archetypes as the gods of the unconscious, 
And um, the ones that are most important in shaping our personality are the persona, the anima and animus, the shadow, and the self. And we'll talk about each of these in turn. The persona is the mask that represents us as we want to appear to society. So it may or may not correspond to an individual's true personality, and it can be thought of as similar to role playing. The anima and animus are uh, when people exhibit characteristics of the opposite sex. So the anima refers to feminine characteristics in men, and the animus denotes masculine characteristics in women. The shadow is our darker self. Now Jung considered the shadow, which he drew in a picture there to the right, to be inherited from lower forms of life and thought it contained immoral, passionate, and unacceptable desires and activities. If we actually do an immoral activity, we say that something came over us and forced us to act that way. On the positive side, the shadow acts as a wellspring of spontaneity, creativity, insight, and deep emotion. The self is important because it integrates and balances all aspects of the unconscious. And Jung actually considered it to be the most important archetype because it provides the personality with unity, stability, and direction, and also focus. Jung likened it uh, to a drive towards self-actualization, although he didn't think that was attainable until middle age, as we said earlier. Uh, that was the critical time for him for personality development. Personality differences are exp expressed through introversion, extroversion, thinking, feeling, sensing, and intuiting. In introversion, the libido is directed inward so that a person is contemplative, where an extrovert directs the libido outside the self. Thinking is a conceptual process that provides meaning and understanding. Feeling is a subjective process of weighing and valuing. Sensing is the conscious perception of physical objects, and intuiting involves perceiving in an unconscious way. Jung labeled thinking and feeling as rational modes of uh, responding because they involve the cognitive processes of reason and judgment. Sensing and intuiting are non-rational. Now from these types comes the Myers-Briggs type indicator and it's based on eight psychological types. So a person could be an introverted intuiting type or an extroverted thinking type or really whatever. The, sex, the success of the Myers-Briggs is ironic because Jung dismissed personality testing as a parlor trick. So it wasn't, the Myers-Briggs was not developed by him. Jung's ideas have influ influenced religion, history, art, and literature Scientific psychology, however, has pretty much ignored Jung. Uh, he's just too mystical and religious for science. Jung created the word association test in the early 1900s, and his version of the test contained 100 words that he believed were capable of eliciting emotions. In terms of the archetypes and the collective unconscious, there's been no scientific validation of them, and really, how could they ever be scientifically validated? Um, that picture there is another page from his red book. We now move on to the social psychological theorists, which were Adler and Horne. Adler was born to a wealthy Viennese family, and his childhood was marked by illness. He actually had a near fatal bout of pneumonia when he was four, rejection, and poor work in school. A teacher told his father that the only job he was fit for was Shoemaker's Apprentice. Adler strove to overcome his handicaps and inferiorities. He gets his medical degree from the University of Vienna in 1895. He became interested in psychiatry and in 1902 joined Freud's group. He was one of the four original members, but his, his relationship with Freud was never close or personal. Adler later rejected the Oedipus complex, perhaps because he was rejected by his own mother in favor of his older brother. Nonetheless, Adler was president of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society in 1910, but he split with Freud the next year. Adler said that Freud is a swindler and psychoanalysis is filth. Freud said that Adler was abnormal, paranoid, jealous, sadistic, 
and short. Adler was actually under five feet tall. So he develops what he calls individual psychology. Now, Adler believed that behavior was determined by social forces, and he comes up with this idea of social interest, which is an innate potential to cooperate with others in order to achieve personal and societal goals. Adler minimized the importance of sex in shaping personality, and he also disagreed with Freud on the alleged inferiority of women. He comes up with this idea of style of life, and these are by behaviors by which we compensate for real or imagined, imagined inferiority feelings. Adler thought that style of life was fixed by the age of four or five and difficult to change after that. He felt that if people fail to compensate adequately for inferior, inferiority feelings, they may develop an inferiority complex, which would render them incapable of coping with life's problems. Adler was also interested in birth order. He said that oldest children become insecure and hostile with the birth of a second child, which he calls dethronement. And he said that criminals, neurotics, and perverts are often firstborn children and said that Freud was a typical oldest child. Adler thought that middle children were ambitious and Adler was a middle child. And he thought that youngest children were spoiled and predisposed to behavioral problems. Now, research shows that firstborns are high in intelligence and likelier to be successful in their careers. Laterborns are more subject to stress and adjustment disorders. Only children tend to be the highest in achievement and self-esteem, which is contrary to what Adler believed. Now, Adler has a large impact on psychology but he's received relatively little credit for his contributions. They're often misattributed to Freud or Jung. Karen Horney, her childhood made her feel inferior, worthless, and hostile. Her father was a ship's captain who was very much older than her mother, and he constantly belittled and berated her appearance and intelligence, meaning his daughters. His nickname among his children was the Bible thrower because that's what he liked to throw at them. Her mother was a liberal and vivacious woman who made it clear that she wished that her husband was dead. As an adolescent, Horne begins a newsletter called The Virginal Organ for Super Virgins and took to walking the streets known to be frequented by prostitutes. She gets her medical degree from the University of Berlin in 1915 and married and had three daughters. She became severely depressed. Uh, she had crying spells, stomach pain, chronic fatigue, thoughts of suicide, and a number of extramarital affairs. She took training at the Berlin Psychoanalytic Institute, got divorced, and had a 20-year relationship with Eric Fromm. When that relationship ended, she underwent Freudian psychoanalysis. When that didn't work, she turned to self-analysis. And she kept on having affairs with younger and younger men. Frome was actually uh, younger than her and an analyst also. And she was supposed to be supervising the, their training, but she was having affairs with them. She went to the United States in 1932 to the Chicago Institute for Psychoanalysis, where she was the associate director. Now, Horne argued that men are motivated by womb envy because they're jealous of a woman for their ability to give birth. She said that men deny women equal rights out of a sense of inferiority due to womb envy. And this was to counter Freud's belief that women were motivated by penis envy. She comes up with this idea of basic anxiety, which is a pervasive loneliness and helplessness in a potentially hostile world. Like Freud, she believed that personality developed in early childhood and anything that disrupts a secure relationship between a child and parents can produce basic anxiety. She also thought that basic anxiety was the foundation of neuroses. She lists, she comes up with a list of 10 neurotic needs and grouped them into three personalities, which corresponded to moving towards others to win affection, which is a compliant personality, moving away from others, which is detached, 
or moving against others, which is an aggressive personality. Horne began her work on feminine psychology in 1922 and drew a distinction between traditional and modern women. A traditional woman sees her identity through marriage and motherhood, and a modern woman looks for her identity through a career. Freud said of Horne, she is able but malicious, and little research has been conducted on her concepts, but her work has had considerable impact. Let's move on now to humanistic psychology. Freud really serves the same purpose as Wundt. He's a source of inspiration and a force to oppose. So humanistic psychology was not intended to be a revision or adaptation of another school of thought. They also opposed behaviorism. Humanistic psychology emphasized conscious experience, human strengths, and positive aspirations, free will, and human potential. And over to your right there, you can see Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Humanistic psychology thought that humans were more complex than rats or robots, uh, and that, couldn't, that people could not be objectified, quantified, and reduced to stimulus response units. They criticized Freudians for only studying neurotics and psychotics and said that if psychologists only concentrated on mental dysfunction, how could they ever learn about emotional health or positive human qualities? Well, Abraham Maslow was driven to understand the greatest achievements of outstanding people in order to determine how they differed from people of average or normal mental health. He got his PhD from the University of Wisconsin in 1934 and started out as an enthusiastic behaviorist. Then a trigger came for him when he watched a parade in New York City after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941. He said, that moment changed my whole life and determined what I've done ever since. He became interested, as we said, in the greatest achievements of outstanding people. He goes to Brandeis and from 1951 to 1969 refined his theory and presented it in a series of popular books. He had a difficult time getting his work published in behaviorist dominated journals and so he wrote his own book. Books. Each person possesses innate, an innate tendency toward self-actualization, which is a full development of their abilities and a realization of their potential. He proposed a hierarchy of needs, which you can see on the previous slide. He thought that people who reached the self-actualization level were free of neuroses and almost always middle-aged or older. He studied the biographies of people he considered to be self-actualizers. So people like Albert Einstein, Eleanor Roosevelt, and George Washington Carver. He also made a list of self-actualizers tendencies one of which was a high degree of what Adler had called social interest. Now, although he was criticized for his sample sizes and his generalizations, his theories have had an impact beyond psychology, and he was elected president of the APA in 1967. Carl Rogers derived his person-centered therapy from working at university counseling centers. And he believed that the responsibility is on the client, not the therapist. He believed that people are able to consciously or rationally change their thoughts and behaviors from undesirable to desirable. Rogers was a solitary, sickly child, and his parents thought he was overly sensitive and nervous. He spent much of his time reading. He gets his PhD from Columbia University in 1931 and works in clinical and educational psychology. Now, his academic career was at Ohio State, the University of Chicago, and the University of Wisconsin. He developed his theory from working with college students. So the people he treated were primarily young, intelligent, and highly verbal. Their problems in general were adjustment issues rather than severe emotional disorders. And this is a vastly different subject population from what was seen by most other clinical psychologists. He develops this idea of positive regard, and that's the unconditional love of a mother for her infant. 
So if a mother satisfies the infant's need for love, they will tend to develop a healthy personality. Otherwise, they see love as being conditional. Self-actualization is the highest level of psychological health, and Roger's view was similar to Maslow's, but the term he uses is fully functioning persons. Rogers felt that humanistic psychology was not perceived as important by mainstream psychology, but they now have 50 journals, uh, actually over 50 journals, and Rogers was elected president of the APA in 1946. Well, let's finish this chapter by talking about Martin Seligman. He introduced the science of happiness, which is now known as positive psychology. He was president of the APA in, 1980, in 1998, but despite his success uh, and research subject matter, he admits that he rarely feels joyful. He gets his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in 1967, and he's still there as a faculty member and professional level bridge player. So you might ask yourself, what makes people happy? Money? Well, yes-ish. People who earn more are more satisfied with their life, but feeling respected and being in control are more important for happiness. What about health? Exercise and other physical activity is positively related to happiness. Age? People get happier as they get older, unless they don't. It's really mixed. Uh, some research shows that happiness goes down from age 18 to 50 and then goes up, but other research shows that it declines in extreme old age. Marriage? Well, in general, yes, but your happiness may depend on your partner's happiness. Also, couples with no children are happier than couples with children. Uh, there's an expression that kids are all joy but no fun. What about personality? Sure, people uh, who are high in self-esteem tend to be happier. How about uh, being good looking, uh, that's actually a very low positive correlation. So you may ask yourself also, which comes first, happiness or success? And research indicates that happiness comes first and leads to the kind of behaviors that can result in success. In 2011, Seligman writes the book, Flourishing, actually the whole title, the full title is Flourishing, uh, A Visionary New Understanding of Happiness and Well-Being. And he finds that people who feel happy um, also uh, excel in their relationships and accomplishments. Positive psychology may represent the enduring legacy of humanistic psychology. Seligman says that positive psychology is just a change in focus from the study of some of the worst things in life to the study of what makes life worth living. Well, that's chapter 14. And thanks for listening.